originally planned to be part of the uh, Transport Research Arena 2020 event that was supposed to be held here in Helsinki, but it got cancelled due to the coronavirus situation. But we are very happy that we got over 160 re registered participants, uh, mostly from Finland, but also from Peru, Mexico, US, UK, Poland, India, Taiwan, and so on. So welcome everyone. But please, audience, mute your microphone so that we can well hear all the presentations. And the questions for the presenters uh, should be written to the chat, and some of them will be then picked for the question and answer part after each presentation. But now let's uh, start, and, and first we will hear a presentation from Hannu Karvonen, VTT, and he will be talking about RAS ecosystem. So Hanno Karvonen works as a senior scientist and ecosystem lead for autonomous systems at VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. He is also currently uh, the coordinator of the Research Alliance for Autonomous Systems, so nowadays called uh, research, Rethinking Autonomy and Safety. So Hanno, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Laura. Hopefully you can hear me. And a warm welcome on my behalf as well. Great to see so many of you online today. Um, so in this presentation, I will shortly go through what exactly RAS is, how can we serve different organizations, and what are our future plans for RAS activities. So uh, just as a background motivation, Next, there are some pointers about the direction to where we see certain domains currently developing and what autonomous systems and the related services may enable in them. So, for example, in urban transport, different kinds of quick door-to-door -door mobility and transport chains will increase. And in interurban transport, safe and fluent traffic with autonomous highway, air and rail solutions are gradually becoming a reality. And also in rural transport, for example, automated and combined people and good services can be utilized. Then if we look at the maritime transport operation side, we will have there ever more fluent logistics enabled by autonomous operations. Also, highly automated mobile work machines like agricultural, forestry or mining machines make, for example, this sustainable productivity possible. And finally, uh, different unmanned air, land and space systems allow novel solutions for efficient logistics and security management, for example, with drones. Now, we also see that there's a big potential for autonomous systems, especially now in the current societal situation where the social distancing, for example, can be helped to be maintained with these systems, such as drones or contact-free delivery robot vehicles and so on. Now, uh, considering those trends and opportunities, then what is this RAS actually all about? So, shortly, RAS is an interdisciplinary innovation ecosystem for autonomous systems research and development. And our aim is to help companies in their innovation activities related to autonomous systems R&D. And in RAS, we have this multi-domain approach where we look at particularly the application domains of land transport, maritime, drone systems and mobile work machines. From research and development team, we also have this ethical, legal, business and technical aspects, especially focused in this RAS. So from the ethical and safety perspective, we have today the panel discussing uh, after these presentations that we have today. So you can find more information about these research teams through our website at autonomous.fi. Then here's some basic facts about RAS. So, the ecosystem is in its first phase uh, funded by the Ministry of Economic Affairs here in Finland. And uh, our vision is to provide this one-stop shop access for all stakeholders to top research and development in autonomous systems. And our mission is then to solve systemic and holistic challenges related to autonomous systems and just to benefit also the society at large, but also the individual companies. And in addition, we have this educational goal of securing the availability of skilled professionals, which I will discuss a bit more detail later. And there on the right, you can see some of the basic numbers about RAS, but maybe I won't go into details of those here, so you can see that yourself them from there. 
Okay, then here you can see our current activities for companies and other organizations. So we can provide something what we call roundtable sessions, which are a one day think tank aimed at different types of organizations on tackling their development challenges. These can nowadays actually also be organized as remote workshops um, in this current situation. So then we have uh, something what we call project accelerator services, which are a relatively short term effort to define the basic concept and consortium for an R&D project entity. You can see from the process picture there what we where we focus typically, so mostly on the concept and consortia de development, for example, for EU projects or other types of network collaboration projects. In addition, we have these team specific work like road mapping and writing of white papers, regulatory policy briefs and so on ongoing to which also the different international partners can contribute to. Then there can also be certain types of innovation challenges. So they are basically a bit different than your usual hackathon type of competitions. These challenges will not happen over a weekend as typical hackathons will happen usually, but instead they are a bit longer lasting and uh, naturally this will also involve the researcher teams in addition to startups and SME teams as well. Then uh, one big concern for our funder, the ministry here in Finland, has been securing the availability of skilled professionals of autonomous systems for the upcoming years. So we are building actually a doctoral school for industrial innovation of autonomous systems with a special role for different involved universities. And actually related to this availability of skilled professionals, also the need for this re-education of adults and increasing lifelong learning opportunities are relevant here, and they are provided, for example, by the involved universities of applied sciences. Then we also plan to offer the involved organizations many possibilities to build these strong links to business relevant test beds that we have. They can be owned, for example, by companies, cities or research institutes. And the purpose here is the networking of these test beds, but also the data sharing between these test beds. So, just to advance uh, this uh, for international testing purposes as well. Then uh, the involved organizations in RAS can get visibility in events like high profile seminars and workshops that we organize, and they can be also done as online versions as this event is done. So in addition, we can also keep the involved organizations up to date, for example, through newsletters and other possibilities meant especially for this cross-domain benchmarking. So there's a lot of different domains that are now taking these autonomous systems into use. And there's a lot of similarities between the technical uh, issues, for example. So we can learn from the other domains quite nicely. Then finally, uh, particularly the universities in RAS can also provide recruitment, coursework and educational training possibilities for the interested organizations. So one thing that is actually not mentioned here is uh, the international collaboration. That is something that we definitely want to advance. So if your non-Finnish organization is interested in RAS, just please contact me. I will show the contact details in the end of this presentation. Here's what uh, we have as key RAS business ecosystem preparations ongoing. So first of all, we are building this Finnish drone accelerator on an ecosystem where the focus is on piloting of drone concepts and business models. Secondly, there's a large project preparation here called Smart Forestry, which focuses on data analytics, automation and situation awareness, specifically for the forest industry. And thirdly, we have a project preparation called SystEco, which is about autonomy driven systemic change in port and logistics ecosystems. Finally, actually, we have very uh, currently ongoing project preparations for the EU's Horizon 2020 security, ICT and CESAR calls. So if you are interested in joining these project preparations, please contact me through email. You can see the address there in the bottom of the screen. Then a few words about what we have planned for future RAS activities. So as a background, uh, some of you might be familiar with the European Commission's white paper related to strategies for data and AI that was published actually in February. And it states that the EU's approach to AI 
which is based on trust and excellence, will give citizens the confidence to embrace these technologies while encouraging businesses to develop them. And it actually also mentions that authorities must be able to check these AI systems similarly as they check, for example, cars. So keeping this in mind, we want RAS to continue to act as a catalyst for companies ecosystem type of innovation activities and in this way also accelerate the introduction of new solutions to the area of autonomous mobility and transport. And specifically related to this EU strategy, the theme for our future operations will be building trust in autonomous mobility AI and actually defining a systematic way to build evidence-based trust in these systems. So that's something what we want to advance in the future. And finally, here are just two uh, future RAS activities where special attention will be paid to this. So first one is coordination of the education and training of autonomy professionals. And this will include, for example, the increase of digital teaching methods, online education and micro credentials is something that is relevant also here. And this approach will actually aim to tackle the big challenge of both the sufficiency of experts and also keeping the education up to date with knowledge in this rapidly developing area. And the second one that is mentioned here is the expertise and services to help companies certify and demonstrate the safety of autonomous AI solutions to authorities, like I mentioned. And here uh, we have a special focus in simulation-based verification, validation and qualification that is to be conducted before going into the real world setting testing. So finally, here's my other contact info. And as I mentioned, there's also more information available at autonomous.fi. Uh, if you are interested in joining this work that we do and being part of creating the future of autonomy through this RAS, you can contact me directly. So thank you and over to you, Laura. So thank you, Hannu. I didn't see any question posted in the chat box, so uh, so please inform me if I missed any. But but meanwhile, you are thinking about the questions. I could start by asking Hannu. So how did RAS got started? Uh, yeah, actually, the maritime industry representatives contacted VTT, Aalto, and Tampere University here in Finland, and asked that could we the research side sort of offer this one-stop shop for the best available research so that they don't have to run around finding the best or the appropriate talent for their projects. And then we started to decide and to build this RAS. And actually, it was clear already from the beginning that we don't do this only for the maritime industry, but instead look across industries. As I mentioned, there are so many similarities, for example, in the technologies that are used in different domains utilizing autonomous systems that it provides a lot of synergies to have this multi-domain approach that we have and currently in this event also are presenting. Yeah, great, thank you. So there is a question, but maybe not so much related to the topic, but about uh, will the slides be distributed to the participants of, of the event? So I, I think that, yes, we will, we yeah. will distribute the, the slides, yes. Definitely. So there is still time for one question. So, so is there anyone in the audience who would like to ask something or am I then allowed to continue? No, seems not. So, so then I, I could ask still that why autonomous system? So what is the benefit typically? So, so what would, would you say? Yeah, uh, as you know, uh, typically autonomous systems are maybe nowadays semi-autonomous or this kind of intelligent assistance or remotely operated systems. So they are not fully autonomous, uh, but uh, we see that uh, these systems can be applied to these environments that typically have these 3Ds, meaning the dirty, dull and dangerous. So in those environments, transferring the workers out of these hazardous areas is one key factor, for example, in mines or ports that is driving this autonomous systems development. And just to make systems and uh, the work uh, environments of people more safe and productive. And well, autonomous systems have also spread to, for example, logistics, where they really enable the optimization of this supply chain. 
so that everything happens just in time. And they also allow the reduced energy consumption and less environmental impacts uh, for for different uh, operations because you can optimize the engine and uh, energy usage. So, and maybe just to say this business opportunity is one as well. So if you have really good data-based operations and the service design or the service business around that utilizing AI, that can really be something that makes your business fly, so to say. Yeah, OK, thank you. And I could still add like the safety of the, the people in the uh, road transport is, is also one very important factor. Definitely. Yeah. OK, yeah. so so great. Thank you, Hannu. So then I, I will um, switch uh, the, the, my slides here. And also present myself, so. Uh, Okay, so, so as already said, so, so my name is Laura Ruotsalainen and I'm an associate professor of spatial temporal data analysis for sustainability science at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Helsinki. And my current research interests include the development of AI methods for accurate and reliable navigation data for also autonomous systems. And I also coordinate a research task force in RAS that Hannu already mentioned called Situational Awareness, Intelligent Control and Autonomous Navigation. But now uh, I will be talking a, a bit about the um, research and development going on in Finland around tran um, uh, autonomous road transport. So we are still quite far uh, from having full autonomous uh, traffic. Um, so, so even the technical requirements set for fully autonomous vehicles are really tough. So, so the autonomous vehicles to operate safely, they must have a full situational awareness and autonomous navigation in action. So they have to be able to monitor internal state, uh, sense perceive, classify and model what is happening around. And at the same time, they must be able to predict what is happening around uh, in, in the near future. And then also the autonomous uh, vehicles, they must work reliable in all environments, which is uh, really difficult, for example, from the navigation point of view. So they have to operate safely and reliably in urban and indoor areas where the satellite navigation is degraded or, or completely denied. And all the time also uh, increasing threat for, for navigation is intentional interference of satellite navigation. So in addition, also the, the um, decision making must be uh, developed further. So at the moment, the autonomous vehicles rely quite a lot in pre-coded decisions. So we have to develop a lot of artificial intelligence based uh, methods for adaptive and learning decision making. And also the human machine interface is something that has to be developed. So, so uh, humans have to be able to take over the control of the vehicles in, in some critical situations. So the vehicles must be dynamically uh, adjusting the level of, of the autonomy while going on. And we all know that when the, the autonomous transportation is, is fully in, in use, so there will be a lot of data uh, coming from, from different sensors and measurements, and that will be the basis of business for many companies. But still, uh, almost all the road users have to have access to some parts of the data, so we have to develop fair and, and secure data sharing capabilities. So, so in RAS, we have uh, defined a road map uh, for the research and, and development for autonomous vehicles for the near future. So we have been uh, um, thinking that, that in the, the very present time, the research is quite a lot concentrating on, on well-performing perception for all situations. So meaning that the, the vehicles are able to navigate and, and get understanding of the environment while they are going along. Then in the, the near future, the research will most likely be uh, concentrating on mature situational awareness and including all the users into the traffic ecosystem. So not concentrating on the individual vehicles anymore. And, and in the, the future, you know, after a decade, so we should be uh, able to provide uh, research results for enabling safe, fully connected autonomous road transportation. 
but but all these parts are mainly from the technical point of view and of course at the same time we need a huge development for for ac ac addressing the uh, legal ethical and business viewpoints of autonomous uh, road transport and then these will be partly addressed uh, during the panel that will come after the presentations so Finland is a great place uh, for, for doing the autonomous uh, road transport research and development. So we have had uh, big uh, nationwide investments done uh, for autonomous driving. We have um, done investments for different infrastructure and technologies that support the autonomous driving development. Uh, for example, in, in the aspects of artificial intelligence, 5G networks, and, and, and also considering the Arctic dimensions of Finland that, that are very beneficial also for the, the development. I will give some examples of these in the coming slides. So also a great thing in Finland is that the law enables testing of autonomous vehicles also in the public roads. And of course, what we are talking today about is, is that uh, the ecosystem fought by RAS, so including uh, the, all the universities uh, from Finland and, and also uh, main research organizations, we will work together with the companies and benefit from the state investments and, and create great research and, and development results in the future. So one of the, the great uh, examples of these uh, investments uh, for, from the perspective of uh, artificial intelligence is the, establish of the uh, establishment of Finnish Center for Artificial Intelligence called FKI that has the, the uh, top scientists from Aalto University, University of Helsinki and VTT working together. And the goal of FKI is to develop a new type of artificial intelligence methods that, that are able to operate with humans and, and to also renew Finnish industry with this AI. And inside the, the FKI, uh, we have also um, established a research program called Autonomous Artificial Intelligence. And, and the goal of, of this research program is, is to develop methods for long-term autonomous operation. So methods for learning and planning to ensure safe operations over long time horizons also. So then uh, Finland has also made huge investments for uh, 5G test sites all around uh, the, the country and also great projects have been started uh, utilizing this 5G network in Finland related to autonomous transport. So for example on EU Horizon 2020 project called 5G Mobix also includes many Finnish organizations and they are creating autonomous transport methods based on utilizing 5G networks and also addressing the legal, business and social local aspects. And then at the University of Helsinki, we are also uh, developing methods for using 5G for autonomous road transport, for example, from the aspects of vehicle to vehicle ranging and also transmission of data to improve the satellite navigation solution. And at the University of Oulu, they are already uh, going forward to, to using 6G uh, networks and then also using those for, for uh, developing methods for self-driving cars, addressing, for example, communication and cooperation between cars using the signals. And as I said also, the, the um, the location of, of Finland is, is very good for, for doing research from the Arctic uh, point of view. So, so in Finland we have um, established an um, uh, Aurora Arctic testing site in, in very northern parts of, of the country. So the Aurora Arctic testing site includes nine kilometers of intelligent road that is instrumented with different kind of equipment that can be used for, for testing um, Arctic navigation and perception uh, methods. And then the good thing with this Aurora Arctic testing site is that it's open for everyone, also for international collaboration. And then also one of, of the great innovators of, from Finland is a company called Sensible4, who have been working for a long time and 
getting also international recognition of their developments addressing autonomous driving in, in very harsh weather conditions. So, so they are able to autonomously uh, uh, navigate and, and operate in weather conditions when there is a snow, rain and very cold weather. So, so even down to uh, minus 28 degrees. So there are great things going around in Finland for research and development for autonomous road transport. And, and if you are interested, so you can definitely contact me. And, and there were many links in the presentation that you can address the people from the, the project that I was mentioning and, and then ask more from them. But now I'm very happy to, to answer any questions that you might have. Yes, thank you, Laura. Um, there's actually one question from Katri Salminen. Uh, she asked that, do you estimate that Finnish or EU level legislation will accept autonomous driving systems operating outside geofenced areas as part of daily transportation in the near future? So do you have any comments on that? Well, the, the, the near future is, is uh, uh, maybe a bit difficult to define, so, so not in, in the year or two maybe, but, but hopefully in the future. But, but maybe the, the legal uh, parts of us uh, might be better answering this question, but hopefully yes. But at least it, it's been very good uh, conversation between the, the authorities in Finland and, and the research and development organizations. So I'm hopeful, yes. Yeah, it's actually in the panel section we are going to be discussing this regulatory and ethical and safety aspects. So maybe maybe we can return to that question in that session as well. Is there any other questions related to Laura's presentation? OK, there's one. So uh, I'm not aware of any Finnish automotive OEMs. Uh, so how does the AI implementation in road transport work? And is it about forming new companies or collaborating with known automotive manufacturers? So do you have comments on that? So, so at least from the research point of view, yes, yes uh, we are collaborating with the international uh, operators. Yeah, yeah. So, so that is there, yeah. Yeah, That's so true. in Finland we don't really have yeah. the OEMs, but we do have a lot of intelligent uh, systems providers for the automotive companies. And we do actually quite a lot of collaboration, especially in EU projects with the Central European uh, Automotive OEMs. So that's the way uh, of collaboration typically here in Finland with the automotive sector. But also Asian, yeah. Of course, yeah. yeah. OK, yeah. maybe that's uh, from the land transport side. So I will yes. then give the moderating role back to you, Laura. And OK, you so continue. thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I will chair myself out then. OK, thank you. Thanks. So, yeah. OK, and, and so then, then next we will hear about autonomous maritime ecosystem and, and, and the presentation will be given by Osiris Valdes Panda. And Osiris Valdes Panda is Assistant Professor of Maritime Technology Research Group of Safe and Efficient Maritime Systems and Experience at Aalto University. His research focuses on the analysis of marine risk and safety systems engineering with applications in the concepts of smart shipping and ship winter navigation. His work focuses on the development of methods and processes for modeling and analyzing the management of the risks, safety and efficiency of the entire maritime ecosystem with focus on ship design and operation. So please go ahead, Osiris. OK, thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Uh, good day to everybody. As, as Laura mentioned, uh, I will try to make this kind of like a fast introduction to this concept of the autonomous maritime ecosystem, but mainly navigating through the challenges and opportunities that we have with this uh, kind of ecosystem towards ensuring safety of the maritime traffic. So let's start with that part. 
So many of us, uh, people who work in the industry or people who work in universities and we are doing research on safety aspects of uh, autonomous ships or the autonomous maritime ecosystem, we claim or at least believe the autonomous ship will have a, a good potential to improve the safety and efficiency of the maritime transport ecosystem. So that's a kind of like a, the main flag that we have been uh, hearing in different projects, different kind of like initiatives for pushing this concept of autonomous ships or autonomous maritime ecosystems forward. But why so? How we can base this? Well, we can just go back to see a little bit about the evolution of the of maritime shipping. We can see that many years ago in the past, we used to have uh, ships that were totally dependent uh, for safety and ensuring efficiency according to the capabilities or the knowledge of the people on board. So nowadays, with the increment digitalization automation, we are capable to have like a big uh, sh uh, ship cruise vessels, which it basically can be represented as a small cities navigating in our oceans. And basically, this has allowed that this kind of ships has become kind of like a sophisticated sense of hubs and data generators. So, as any other city, these small cities floating in our oceans, they, they, they produce and transmit information from anywhere and quite often in, re in, in real time. So this basically increment digitalization automation has uh, allowed this massive increase on volume of data transferred by having this kind of like uh, improving satellite communications connectivity. So nowadays we are capable or ships are capable to transfer a huge amount of data for a very lower cost. So, but if we look into the future, we start to talk about, uh, uh, I think for uh, the last 10 years, about the new concept of autonomous ships, uh, different industries basically saw or present some kind of like ideas about how the future may look like uh, uh, for maritime shipping. And this is basically because this kind of like a digital information flows are driving the automation of processes and functions. So if this concept of these uh, efforts for, uh, for producing these autonomous maritime ecosystems and introduce autonomous shipping into the maritime industry, we may have a very positive impact on safety, commercial and environmental performance of the maritime traffic. That's, that's kind of like a, a strong uh, belief towards pushing these kind of ideas forward. However, it's quite important to understand also that more digitalization and automation increase the ecosystem complexity and the risk. Why so? Well, we have a higher complexity um, ecosystem because we will have a, a, we will need a better integration. So we will have more specialized ships and systems and more digital connections. We also will have a control systems, more software control existence, which will require more frequent updates and also uh, maintenance. Another important aspect that I'm kind of like uh, remarking here is the emergent behavior of those kind of like a new systems to be developed. So this system and component interaction basically create new risks, new risks that we actually don't know of now, but we need to be prepared for those. And one important aspect is that uh, many industry partners and researchers start to realize that the traditional approaches for ensuring or analyzing risk or managing risk or managing the complexity of the ecosystem are not enough. So basically nowadays we need this, uh, approaches who are capable to analyze system behavior, software functions and interfaces in an appropriate way that guarantees that the, the systems and the maritime ecosystem that we are trying to, to build in the future will work as planned. And the risk of course they will also increase because uh, we will have new equipment and sensors. So these new equipment and sensors need uh, adequate uh, measurements, a proper installation, and estimation of physical, uh, a proper uh, estimation of the physical degradation of such a system. We will have, of course, software errors. Software errors, you know, there are many claims about the reducing of the human error with the concept of autonomous chips is something that has been a uh, a uh, longly discussed and concepts and ideas about uh, pushing uh, uh, this concept forward and the contribution to autonomous shipping. But anyway, software errors uh, we will uh, represent it on programming errors and also an in artificial intelligence and machine learning challenge that we will have, and also in how to basically build adequate system robustness for this uh, autonomous maritime ecosystem. So the human factor is basically 
heavily represented in this area. Then we will have the cyber risk, of course. The cyber risk comes to those uh, cyber risks uh, linked to safety, those unintentional and hidden errors that can be, for example, the programming errors that we, we can have. Uh, but also something new is the, the cybersecurity risk, which basically uh, focus on those attacks and connectivity risks that we may have uh, when we uh, basically design and start to operate this uh, autonomous maritime ecosystem. So, just to make a, a kind of like a simplify a systemic view of this autonomous maritime ecosystem, we know that we will have the, the ship as a main element of this ecosystem. And this ship uh, is uh, composed by different kind of like, a, let's call it subsystems, which are the proposed on plant management, auxiliary power management, auxiliary machinery operation, balance entry management, navigation and maneuvering, cargo handling operations, dispersal and maintenance. But for example, one that is very relevant for this concept is the IT and communication systems. So when we think about the ecosystems, when we zoom in in any of these subsystems, we will need to understand the adequate functionality and how to design and operate and adequate functionality of particular internal systems as the ones that we can see in this figure. But of course, uh, in order to ensure that a smart ship can operate efficiently, we need to also design and operate in a smart environment. So if we zoom out, we need to see that how this, for example, uh, subsistence on board the ships will, be, uh, will depend a lot on the adequate functionality of external uh, systems. So these external systems can be uh, represented with satellites, ground station, servers, PC devices, internet, and many other technological aspects for having this kind of like a, a um, autonomous uh, maritime ecosystem uh, outside of the operation of the ship, ensuring uh, a proper function to make this kind of like a, a smart uh, shipping possible. What is safety? Well, if you think about what is safety, safety here is everywhere. So safety basically is an ecosystem property and it's a dynamic non-event process. So this uh, safety has to be integrated into any aspect developed and any aspect uh, to be designed and operated in the in the in the autonomous maritime ecosystem. Well, the autonomous maritime ecosystems need to remain sustainable. That's very important. So we need to have an appropriate balance between why we're doing these efforts to introduce in autonomous ships and what is going to be represented a balance, uh, a balance uh, benefit for the input or the footprint that we have in the environment and also the benefits related to the society. And of course, the economical aspects. So basically how companies and people have basically build business around this kind of like a autonomous maritime ecosystem. But of course, sustainability is a very popular concept nowadays. It's very important, but safety is critical here because if we cannot guarantee that the, our autonomous maritime ecosystem is safe, basically the complete concept of sustainability will fail. So uh, where this kind of like initiatives towards building this uh, autonomous maritime ecosystem is happening? Well, there are many places that are I put some figures here and some icons about ongoing concepts, ongoing projects uh, in different countries around the world. We have a uh, different concept to be uh, built in, in, in Norway, for example. Here in Finland, we have the One Sea Autonomous Maritime Ecosystem, where we are nowadays working on this uh, Sea for Value Fairway of Navigation project, where we are basically focusing on developing uh, an Italian fairway that allows a, a remote and a autonomous pilot operations. In other countries, like for example, in Netherlands, similar initiatives focus on the ecosystem are, are going on with, for example, this vessel train and different kind of like uh, research labs and research initiatives led by uh, research groups in, for example, in Singapore, in Denmark, and also here in Finland with the RAS is something that is happening. So this is a, these initiatives are going very, very strong forward in this kind of like uh, countries that are kind of like a, uh, putting down in my slide. So just to conclude this presentation, so this autonomous maritime ecosystem, of course, will bring challenge, but also opportunities for the safety of the maritime traffic. It is true that advanced digitalization and automation looks like a strong alternative to improve safety and reliability and efficiency of the, of the maritime traffic in general. However, 
we need to plan for design and operating a safe maritime ecosystem by making a proactive management of risk and ecosystem complexity. So, you know, the people who work in the, in the maritime industry, the maritime industry for many years has been criticized for being reactive towards safety. I think that now with this kind of ideas for building this autonomous maritime ecosystem, we have a great opportunity to change uh, that role to be more, pro pro more proactive towards ensuring safety on maritime traffic and the operation of ships. So I think I conclude here. And if you have a, any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much for listening. So thank you, Osiris. Yes, there is uh, immediately one question. So what additional challenges autonomous unmanned ships would have to face in Arctic environment compared to other operating areas, for example, Mediterranean? Well, that, that's a very interesting question and a very challenging question on this uh, Arctic shipping. Basically, navigation in ice conditions is quite different than the navigation in open sea. So uh, it uh, can be solved with uh, hopefully some kind of like a technology head on new development of technologies. But of course, uh, we depend a lot also on the experience of the people on board of ships operating on, 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 on winter navigation. So we need to be sure how it is possible to transfer that knowledge and how it's possible to still uh, use the experience and information of uh, experts on winter navigation to to implement kind of like a new concept for autonomous operations in winter in, in, in winter navigation or in Arctic navigation or basically navigation in ice condition. But of course, the challenge is, 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 is quite different and it's quite it's, it's quite complex, let's just say. OK, thank you. So are there other questions from the audience? Uh, seems not so, then I can also ask one question. So so in the past, um, the, the maritime field has been quite slow to adopt the, the new technologies, but now we've seen really cool demos of these autonomous ships lately. So, so how long do you think it will take before the first autonomous ships will be really operating in the seas? It depends. I think uh, this is a question around uh, goes to many people. If you think about uh, having ships ready, they can be ready in a very short time. But to have it, those ships actually operating, it take it may take a little bit longer. Uh, different perspectives are or different estimations are done by, for example, authorities. IMO has uh, a view, for example, that perhaps around uh, 2035 is when we start to see uh, autonomous ship operating. Of course, uh, other industry players know that this can be possible to do uh, much uh, faster or sooner. So I think it depends a lot on how to basically make the ships available uh, or ready for the operation, which in my opinion is uh, it's not very far from now. But uh, we need to basically get the, the ecosystem ready for putting those ships operating as snow, uh, we need to know first how these ships also will uh, will be uh, uh, existing with ships which are basically not, uh, with the, they have any kind of like a high autonomous level. So there are many questions still on the air about how to ensure a proper function of autonomous shipping in the real world, that uh, they need solutions before we can actually see the, the operations uh, of ships. And international weather, maybe the national weather, there are already initiatives uh, in many different countries that are happening, and this is kind of like a more more simple to, to, to execute. Okay, thank you. So then there was still one question. So what's now the current state of the IMO RSE? Yeah, well, I don't really think I understand clearly this question, uh, but uh, Yeah, well, I can say that, for example, in a very recent uh, document, I think it was provided uh, two years ago about the basically the position of an IMO towards autonomous shipping. There are many kind of like a, a positions towards this kind of like a, whether the principal task that can be uh, transferred into more highest levels of automation for the maritime industry. And now when you say about the regulatory aspect, well, this is a huge challenge. Uh, there are uh, efforts done by different players 
in different countries also. I know in Finland many people are also working on this regulatory scope uh, or, regu or changes on the regulatory framework for the for my time shipping. But I think it's just a starting. I think, to be honest, I think this is the the the, the field of research which demands uh, harder work in order to push this concept forward. So this one is the one that's kind of like a going slowly, let's just say it like that. Okay, so great, thank you. So then we will go forward and, and next we will hear about unmanned aerial vehicles and then the presentation will be given by Timo Lind, who is working as a principal scientist in VTT. He is focusing to develop drone related research and projects. So please Timo, go ahead. Okay, let's see if I also get the video. And Laura, can you confirm that you see my slides? I see your slides, but not on the, okay, now on the presentation mode also. Thank you. Okay. Okay, hello from sea to air to the, what's happening in the drone scheme in Finland. So my name is Timo Lind and I'm working as the principal scientist in VTT Mobility, mainly working with the drones. So there are still sometimes questions that uh, what, what are the use cases for the drones. I have collected some examples, not necessarily all this happening in Finland, but uh, globally there start to be a lot of use cases that the drone, drone is really daily tool and uh, practical, it reduces costs and uh, brings a lot of benefits. I don't go detail to all, all these, these, but you can quickly read, read that, uh, for example, security surveillance area in uh, authority, US police, fire departments, inspections, road, road conditions, bridges, water towers, so on. So a lot of good examples. And uh, here is one slide from the CESAR. So the vision is something that the, today we have these, uh, many of these uh, traditional airplanes, thousands, thousands of those filling the sky in the normal conditions. But the direction is something that the extra to those, there will be a lot of these uh, smaller unmanned vehicles also the urban air mobility kind of things that the drones which can, can carry also passengers or higher cargo payload. But the key words as, as in the C presentation, automation or autonomy plus connectivity, these are something what will bring this to reality. And the, when we discuss this future drone things, it those are of course part of the um, uh, digitalization whole, of whole aviation and uh, mixing mixing the traditional aviation and, and this uh, this modern or this unmanned aviation and the especially what's happening in the city areas that's one of the focus areas but uh, also for example the Scandinavian country cases, the rural areas are also very interesting that what are the new, new things that the drones could make sense. Drones can be seen also very strong integration point that a uh, lot of things around are developing very fast. So there, there, there is the 5G radio systems coming, coming. there is a lot of uh, Things happening in the regulation side. The, there are smart landing stations. The, there are hydrogen fuel cell trials. There is the use space systems coming, fleet management uh, going forward, and so on. So very, very interesting to be in the center of these, all these, these things, regulations or technologies or on the use cases. And uh, luckily in the VTT we have activities ongoing in many of these areas. So, so we, can, we, we can pick many of these things and, and see how to connect these to the drones also. We are also doing a lot of uh, activities what comes to the Business Finland projects. 
we, we are develop, developing many Horizon 2020 and in future Horizon Europe projects. We are doing projects together with the industry, with the Nordic innovation. We are very active partner in, in all ecosystems which are working, working in the drone area. And already previously mentioned this drone accelerator activity. And uh, here is one example, of, for example, the test facilities, what we have in the VTT, so the icing wind tunnel that we can uh, simulate very bad weather conditions, so the real winter conditions and do, do testing with the drones, for example. But here, so the autonomity or autonomous systems, those are in the center and also in the, with the drones, what's happening next is the really next generation use cases or drone, drone solutions and, and key elements which will enable this is this um, new European wide regulation which is hopefully coming already this summer or the first, first step from that is deployed this summer. So that will bring new classes to the, to the drone operations and, and manufacturing, so the specific category and, uh, and certified category in longer term. Other key element is this uh, use space, so that's the air traffic control to the airspace where, where the drones are operating, so the, it will provide the fast approval for the drone, drone flights and, and also tracking and, and the, of course the PV loss flying. The connectivity, so the definitely direction is, is so that the, we want to replace the current LOS radios with the, with the 5G radios to, to control the drone and of course to get the higher data rates from drone, drone to the land stations. And a development in the autonomy and remote piloting fleet management areas, all, all these bring, bring excellent tools that, the, that what, 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 what do you think today you can do with the drones in, in, in coming years, this all can happen remotely and an automatic base. So we will have a automatic flying robots do, doing different kind of missions. So here is one picture from the coming European regulation. So the target day, as I already said, is this July, this, this summer. There are some risks, what relates to Corona, Corona with this day, but uh, at least currently it seems that this is the day that the new European wide regulation is deployed also in Finland. And main new thing there is this specific category, which so there, there will be some limitations, but also new opportunities what can, can be done. And really in the prof professional drone usage, this specific category is, is the tool. So we want to replace this old kind of setup that there is the drone, man, man, line of sight radio and visual contact to the drone. We want to go in this direction that uh, we have a 5G connectivity, we have fleet of drones operated by the operation center and one, one person and uh, data going directly to the, directly fast and reliably to the data centers. Also, of course, the use space elements and, uh, and swarms can be, can be something which relates to this future diagram. Oh, well, how, how do we see this future? And uh, use space, there are several phases, U1, U2, and, uh, but I don't go deeper into details. Potential, oops, potential business cases, what, seem, uh, what seems to be most potential in, in Finland in, in coming years, really, the surveillance security kind of use cases, inspection, delivery, delivery drone is surely coming in, in some form, 
Is it medicine deliveries or is it even some fast food deliveries? Don't know yet. But they could be tool, for example, for this rural area maintenance. Forestry related things, surely important with the drones. And a drone, drone can be a great tool for many, many use cases in that area. Also in agriculture, 3D models collect data with the LIDAR and, and this photogrammetry meters. In a infrastructure, construction building projects, the bigger road construction areas or factory building areas. This urban air mobility is coming maybe in, in some longer term. And a multi-drone, meaning that when the drone is doing some operation, it's also collecting data, for example. And uh, some uh, benefits from these autonomous drone services, so fast point-to-point -point delivery, low emissions, these are mainly uh, operated by the batteries, uh, new tool to support rural areas in big cities, maybe the fastest way to deliver, uh, when we think the bigger urban air mobility kind of devices that can land in the smaller landing areas compared to traditional helicopter. Operation cost of the urban air mobility can be cheaper compared to helicopter. We don't know exact figures yet, but that's the expectation. Real autonomy, remote piloting is coming. Definitely this lower labor cost when there is one person who can <coughs> who can operate the fleet of drones. Uh, automatic systems with the drones, you can reach difficult dangerous locations, uh, carry camera sensors, co tool to collect data, samples, and farms in some, some use cases. Here are a couple of the pictures from the urban air mobility. So there are there start to be also European manufacturers in this area. So Polocopter in Germany, Lilium in Germany, Ihang is the Chinese company, but also present in Europe, even in Sweden, they have Kapla Aero, which have plans for this kind of flying urban air mobility. So that was basically my presentation, and I'm now available for questions. Laura, any questions? So, so yes, thank you, Timo. There, there is one. So, how do you see the role of drones in this new societal situation due to the coronavirus pandemic? What could be, for example, the main use cases where drones could be utilized? Excellent question. And uh, unfortunately, if this corona would have happened maybe two years after, after or later, we have, would have, could have much better tools, tools but. Uh, Thinking this kind of situation that the people are locked in the houses, it would be extremely useful tool that, uh, for example, in, the, in this delivery drone use case, that uh, you could uh, order something from the local stores and uh, there, there would be very fast delivery for those items that the drone would bring ordered items directly to your backyard. For example, that kind, of, that kind of case. And of course, in the authority side, uh, maybe drones, drones could be a good ex new tool for the police so that they better follow that what, what is happening in, in different locations and these kind of things. Even there have been proposals that the drones could, put, could, could do some disinfection kind of tasks that in the park. So public areas. But I don't, uh, to answer this question, I, I think this uh, delivery drone and uh, mm -hmm. that, that could be the tool, to useful tool in, in this kind of conditions. Yeah, thank you. Great ideas. So are there other questions from the audience? If not, so then I will again ask one question. So, um, what do you think is are the biggest challenges in developing fully autonomous drones? So, so if you have to name one, what is the, the biggest thing that we should now be concentrating at and putting forces? 
that's easy to answer. It's money. <laughs> uh, well, if, yeah. If, yeah, if, if that's yeah. not, not yeah. the but one the, that we are looking the, for. Yeah. But as I said, I, in, a, in a regulation, start to be very, very supporting. So, so very demanding use cases can be implemented uh, what comes to regulation. Technologies start to be very advanced and the drones, drones itself start to be reliable and, uh, and can uh, all of them can handle the harsh conditions also, Arctic weathers and, and, and so on. The, the fleet management is, is, is developing and, uh, and reality is use space th 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 things are coming that the I, I would very maybe still answer this that we what we need that we we need to kind of uh, uh, companies who 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 has kind of open mindset to really try out this new new kind of technologies and new new ways to do things and and to also do do some investments in in this area that, that I, I I think that that's that's the area almost most challenging area that uh, still, uh, for example, this kind of scenarios what I was presenting in this scenario are, are still something that not not many many kind of traditional business uh, who are running the traditional business are not, not very familiar or what, how, how, how many things could be already possible. And so good, fresh mindset and, uh, and the some some investments and uh, we, we can do very very uh, not a lot of new use cases or replace the old use cases with the, with the wrong services okay thank you so so still there's one good question so but very uh, short answer please so what companies might be the first ones to launch fully working drone delivery business of course the, of course the, uh, and unfortunately or depend depend on your angle that the this this uh, logistic companies are strong so so the amazon and, and uh, google wing and, and the yeah. dhl so basically they 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 already have this uh, logistic chain so the the drone drone delivery is just one one piece they can add in, ter, in the internal service so so definitely, and, and all, all these uh, big logistic companies are doing piloting and testing testing in this area. That surely, yeah. surely they, they they have uh, all the basic elements, and they have money. So it's uh, yeah. just, just something that they add add also drones in the portfolio. Okay, thank you. So the user aspects. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> but th thank you, Timo. So, so then we'll go to the last presentation, uh, which will be about autonomous mobile working machines and given by Reza Gabcello, who is an associate professor for heavy machine automation. His research interests include optimal control and trajectory optimization, sensor fusion for situational awareness, and robot learning. Professor Capcello is also active in education, is responsible for master's program on robotics in Tampere University. He is currently PI or VPPI for several projects funded by Horizon 2020 and Business Finland. So please, Reza, go ahead. Thanks, Laura, for the, for the intro. I will uh, <clears throat> share now my screen. Hello, everybody. Uh, I assume my, my screen now is shared and you have my screen yes. here. Yes. Very good. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, unfortunately, it was not possible, of course, to, to meet all, uh, at least partly. Maybe this is also has made possible that some of people who are abroad can actually attend this meeting. So my name is Gop Chelurez. I'm associate professor, as Laura mentioned, with Tampere University Faculty of Engineering and Natural Sciences. Our unit is automation technology and mechanical engineering. We have three groups here. <clears throat> really automation, mechanical engineering, and hydraulics or fluid power. And all these three parts in this unit, all uh, uh, one way or another work toward robotics. And uh, and it means that uh, in, in this unit, basically we are, we are as, a, as, a, uh, as it was also mentioned, we are having this uh, robotics major 
uh, and uh, I'm, I'm the uh, responsible person in this. Today I'm talking about autonomous mobile machines. And these are the machines we are talking about. Forest machines, mining machines, uh, cranes, uh, wheel loader, excavator. And these are the companies that we have around Tampa. It's quite a strong Tampa region. Uh, the machines we have, <clears throat> this, this specific, specific kind of a characteristics of these machines is that they are working off highway. They are on, in the unstructured environment, harsh environment, and they are highly variable compared to, let's say, uh, steel drones or, or automotive. Uh, they are highly variable in terms of uh, locomotion, in terms of uh, uh, the boom or manipulation. They are mobile manipulator. It means that they don't only move from A to B, they actually move from A to B to do some job. So it means that they actually have a manipulator to do the job. And that makes this uh, complexity in terms of a, uh, in terms of a designing or even deciding how many sensors or actuators you need to, uh, to put on these machines. They are generally uh, driven by hydraulics and fluid power. Uh, the driving part is moving toward electrification. But the boom part, uh, because of special characteristics of, of hydraulics, it has, I don't think it's going to be replaced anytime soon. So uh, future I see that we have electrified uh, mobility, but uh, hydraulics, uh, hydraulics boom or actuators. Uh, down there you see one of our machines in, in this. I, I state uh, one, one extract from the business tamper state. That it states that uh, uh, tamper region uh, uh, kind of uh, the most intelligent mobile machines or working machines of Europe come from Tampere. So I don't need really to go far to, to find uh, uh, leading companies in this area. <clears throat> in, back in 2008, when we had the Center of Excellence on the Academy of, of, of Finland Center of Excellence on generic intelligent machines together with uh, uh, at the time uh, Technical University of Helsinki, now Aalto University, our vision was that um, we would like a, a work site to have uh, robots or autonomous machines working alongside but with a human and we have a, a control station that the human uh, an operator supervise and we also heard uh, uh, in previous talks that there are also visions similar vision for other mobility sectors so let's see we have uh, what we have done uh, Still, seen then, so kind of in, in let's say six, seven years from the vision, we we build a demonstrator where uh, where we had this uh, working machine, <coughs> green machine, uh, needs to to navigate autonomously in the in a work site, so it needs to make um, a model of the world, what we call the mapping. Uh, uh, make the, uh, needs to make a decision, needs to, uh, to, to do plan, communicate with other type of uh, robots. So in this case, drones that provide other type of sensor, kind of sensing information, and how they share share information among them, and how they make a decision. When they are outside, of course, they can use uh, general. They can use uh, GPS, GNSS, uh, localization base, and but when they are inside. They need to do um, uh, navigation using their vision. So in this case, this this machine is docking to that uh, station to be repaired. And it, as you can see, this uh, this robot, uh, industrial robot, is is going to replace one one piece of the machine. So there also we use we use vision and and control. So uh, in, in my group, uh, we have been working a lot on on. Uh, on optimal power transmission and motion control, specifically for hydraulic machines and drive. So how you go from A to B with the minimum energy consumption. So that's one thing. Then the second part is the integration, integrated sensing and control, uh, where we have been focusing more on the, on the pallet picking and pallet handling. Um, and in this case, it was also used for just the docking on this station for, for maintenance. We have also done a lot of work on the situation awareness and, and world modeling, SLAM, and of course, autom autonomous navigation using those information. And, all, and uh, the more recent activities I have, I am uh, doing is on robot learning and trajectory optimization. 
Uh, I'll give some more more details on, on this, some example videos when it comes in the last last slides. I, I start with a couple of uh, uh, example projects uh, and then uh, I will uh, detail a bit uh, robot learning of, as, as a research question. Uh, one of the example projects I, I'm coordinating as a coordinator is this uh, European Industrial Doctorate on, on uh, next generation heavy duty mobile machinery which focuses on, on artificial intelligence driven robotization, energy efficiency and process optimization. This is a network of uh, uh, several uh, world leading uh, uh, heavy duty machinery companies like uh, Lieber, Volvo Construction Equipment, John Deere, Cargotech, Bosch Rexroth and Novatron and of course uh, other universities like Örebro University and KIT. Interesting question to answer in this in this projects are, are uh, related to a um, couple of them are on the kind of three work packages on the optimization, one on the process optimization, one is the machine optimization, you have to deliver the basically the uh, because these machines are quite high consumption. Uh, how you build in machines with uh, that consume less? And of course, uh, as we have been discussing, uh, we have been hearing the last uh, few presentation, the process itself and digitalization bring most of the uh, most of the productivity and uh, and energy efficiency. So we have also some few least, uh, three students working on, on that area. And then the control part, which is probably the most uh, related to what I, I'm doing in my research, are related to um, how these robots uh, work, we can work in the harsh environment. Uh, uh, and uh, they can still produce intelligent and safe behaviors. And then, uh, as, as I will give more more toward the robot robot learning in the in the coming coming slides, what it what it actually is in this in this field. Another example uh, uh, project uh, um, uh, uh, work package leader in this one is the AI Hub Tamper. I would like to introduce AI Hub Tamper for intelligent machine is actually a, a project uh, supported by by a structural fund from EU and uh, and uh, city of Tampere to support local businesses in AI and industrial robotics. We have uh, health test sessions, one hour and a half. We have workshop four times a year. We have experimental trials one week, and they are all for free. We want to have a, to make uh, AI and robotics easy to reach and affordable neutral and equal to everybody. If you want more information, please visit AI. AI, uh, Tampere AI. Uh, we are now under city of Tampere because it was so uh, popular and the things has been uh, growing so fast. Now we have become under a bigger, bigger ecosystem and consoles. You find more information there. So why robot learning? As I said, uh, among those, I chose only one uh, as example because of the time is short. Robot learning is basically what we want to do is that we would like to have an operator demonstrate something, then we learn that and then we excavate autonomously. So in this process, we don't do the conventional way, which is basically modeling the robot and the environment and then use model based techniques. Why is that? Because uh, there are some processes like earth, earth moving case that are difficult to model. So the process itself is very difficult to model. There are a lot of changes like moisture changes and, and the granularity changes and every time you need to have a new model. As I said also these machines, uh, I gave you example, there are a, a very big variation in these machines and then you want to design one controller and then uh, for the next one you need to make a design another controller and so on. And of course we have a lot of experience operator and we want to see if we can actually transfer those experiences through demonstration to to uh, to actually controller. In this video you see uh, we have a paper on ACRA 2020 in Paris June. If you attend the ACRA you will see more detailed and technical information about this. There we basically, um, uh, the, the idea is that you will collect sensor data from the pressure sensors and the kinematic sensors, the camera data, and then uh, we have demo we have demonstrated beforehand. Now you see only the t the, the testing part, ex autonomous excavation. We have been trying different techniques, and this is now comparing different different uh, uh, solutions. As you can see, 
as you have as I've written here, one of the challenges when we use AI and more uh, data driven is the stability and safety, how we can guarantee this. I, another question is the generalization. Well, we learn in the winter and you want to uh, use it in summer or the other way around, you use uh, wet sand and you want to use in the uh, to use it uh, with a with a dry sand and how how that that can go. So these are all the difficult questions you need to answer. Okay, where we do things, uh, we have a we have a test area. It's a, we call a center for intelligent uh, mobile machines, 4,000 square meter, 250 meter track, asphalt, gravel, different slopes. And also we have areas for excavation. We have uh, different excavators and wheel loaders of different side tractors and forwarder. So, um, as I said, there are, I, I focus compared to the uh, other other uh, uh, presentation on, on the research I'm doing. As I said, I'm working with the most uh, in the field, and the research questions we are addressing are more very closely related to what is the uh, the question one of the important thing i would like to mention before i close this is that um, this machine that you saw here they are not really commercial machines uh, working the green machine or the yellow ones uh, are actually designed and built in our 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 uh, department and that's where we have uh, many other groups working it's not only me uh, working on the predictive maintenance working on hybrid hydraulics working on the uh, on the smart actuators and hydraulics, and of course, as I said, mechanical engineer and others. So uh, it's a big, uh, big effort to maintain this and build this. And this is the, the, the uh, acknowledge goes to the big group and a lot of funding we have had so far for keeping this running. Thanks for attention. I will be happy to answer any questions now. Thank you, Reza. So do we have questions from the audience? So while the audience is, is thinking, I can start with. So, so you talked about this training for that you provide for companies free, free, for free. So, so what kind of prior knowledge is required? So, so what do you have to know to be able to follow your uh, conference uh, series? And yeah. yeah, we have a. Uh, of course, we have one hour and a half uh, session. It means the companies could come uh, from very, very. We have companies that they don't even have a. Uh, we have probably just one elect electrician in the company, so uh, there is not really a need for that. So they come with a problem and they want to solve, and we would like to. We can tell that can we help? Can the AI help? Can we um, basically? That's that's the way we do it. And of course, then we have workshops. Uh, they have had uh, different levels uh, from the actually programmers to more senior management side to see so our workshops also cover that uh, different levels of, of uh, uh, basic information that uh, requires from both hands on workshops and also some general things about how to, how these things are progressing the trends and how useful they are and then the one week demo that the companies could come and then uh, they provide the, the problem then we agree and then we, we Eventually, at the end of the week, we provide a report on the result. Let's say they want to try to see if they something works or not, if this is promising or not, and then if they want to proceed with a larger project or a company project or a business finance project, EU project or whatever that leads to. So that is kind of a, the way we worked. OK, great. Thank you. So I, I think the time is up for the presentation. So, so then I will turn to ni, ni, the uh, time. Time for Nina and Mika to start the panel. So, so please go ahead. Thank you very much, Laura and, and others for your presentations and uh, welcome on my behalf as well. My name is Nina Rilla and uh, the rest of the afternoon we will concentrate on uh, on a panel discussion on designing ethical and safe autonomous transportation. Uh, really uh, concentrate uh, to certain uh, transportation, but we talk more about generally about autonomous mobility in this panel. But as this is our first online panel, 
ever. So uh, we have done our best to to uh, moderate uh, this discussion smoothly. But a few uh, reminders, please still keep your microphones uh, muted. And if you want to pose a question, please use the chat as 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 in the uh, during the previous um, session as well. And if you want to specifically um, address a question to person, please also indicate in that uh, chat to whom you want to address your question to. And then in the uh, very end of the um, uh, the panel, we will have a, a Q and A uh, session where you can also then uh, pose your questions. But please also then ask um, ask uh, Floor in the in the uh, in the uh, uh, chat. So um, today, like I said, we will um, concentrate on, on designing ethical and safe autonomous mobility and transportation. Um, who we are in the panel. So uh, we have two moderators, myself. Um, I'm a Nina Rilla and I work as a senior scientist in the area of ethics and uh, responsibility of innovations at VTT. And my current work relates to ethical applications and governance of AI in Strategic Research Council at the Academy of Finland funded ETAIROS project, in which also RAS is, um, is one of our use cases. Uh, my co-moderator uh, is, is Mika Nieminen, who works as a principal scientist and team leader of ethics and responsibility of innovations team at VTT. And his current work covers especially uh, development of impact assessment methods, as well as technology, ethics and responsible innovation related questions. Then we have three panelists. Uh, we have Taina Kalliokoski uh, from the University of Helsinki. Um, and she's a researcher of social ethics in, uh, in, uh, in the Faculty of Theology. And currently she works uh, with the multidisciplinary Etaros project, the, the same that I already mentioned, um, where she ponders AI ethics. And she's also soon to be PhD as she prepares to defend her doctoral thesis in early June. Our second panelist is Valtteri Laine from, uh, uh, from the Finnish Transport and Communications Agency Traficom. And Valtteri works um, as a special advisor. Uh, he also holds a position uh, in the European Union strategy for the Baltic Sea region as a policy area coordinator. Uh, Valtteri is focused on maritime safety and risk management issues, and he is also qualified sea captain and conducts doctoral studies at, at Aalto University. Our third panelist is Saulia Loranda, who works at VTT Technical Research Center, um, and he's a professor of practice for safety and security. And his area covers resilience in society, cybersecurity, autonomous systems, and smart mobility and transport. Uh, he has also very vast experience from industry, uh, for example, from Rolls Royce, establishing an RDI center in Finland for autonomous shipping. And currently he acts as a chairman of Business Finland Digital Advisory Board. At least for me, this uh, topic of safety is, is really interesting. And, and in the earlier discussions, you already uh, heard very many ethical values, for example, trust, responsibility. But also safety is very topical at the moment because it seems to be one of the main drivers of, of designing autonomous systems. But at the same time, safety is, is one of the ethical values, but it's not certainly the only one. While autonomous transportation should be safe, it should be uh, non-discriminating, human and meaningful for users, as well as all AI aided systems like autonomous cars should be trusted and logic of action made transparent and explainable for the users. 
for me, this is, sounds very, very complex, and this is something what we are going to address today. So our discussion will focus on what safety actually is and whether it is univocally perceived value. And we have asked um, our three panelists to, to think what are, in their opinion, the three most critical ethical and responsibility challenges in autonomous mobility and transportation. And now I would like to ask Taina to start, and then it's Valtteri and, and Sauli. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Taina, and my three is the most critical ethical challenges in autonomous transportation, as Willa mentioned, are first, I think that uh, there is the problem of risk detection and prevention. Uh, and I think that this is an ethical question because the autonomous transportation systems are based mostly on adaptive algorithms. And the problem is how we can predict every possible situation where something may go wrong or they may cause harm or some uh, collapse or uh, contradict with different uh, actors in traffic in maritime or land or air. And the systems may run smoothly in test environment, but the nature and people as part of it are really unpredictable. So uh, in order to take responsibility or prevent different kind of harms to people, and environment, we need to detect and prevent it. So I think that this detection prevention is an ethical problem. The second one is uh, human autonomous system interaction. And the complicated systems needs really um, complicated collaboration and cooperation between, between human and autonomous systems. And the, this is huge area of research, of course, uh, and has been going on a long time. But the key problem is that human needs to trust to the systems as the users and uh, uh, overseers and uh, in different roles. But uh, when humans trust too much to the automated system, there might, might be, they, they may be lulled in the false sense of security. And that may be a, a security and safety problem. And I think that is also ethical collaboration problem. And then there is the question is who is responsible when something goes wrong and in different critical situations when people need to react and their contribution is needed. If their abilities are dormant or they're, they're not alert of the different kind of signs that occurs in the system. So there are some some uh, uh, models of the optimize these human autonomous system interactions. For example, for aviation, the NASA's researcher should has created this complementation model. That the key idea is that humans and automated systems complement each other. That uh, automate uh, the total automation or autonomous autonomously running system is not the purpose of the development, but the smooth collaboration. And the third ethical problem, I think, is uh, the value conflicts in autonomous systems. Um, they are revealed in action, I think, that in human action and in autonomous transportation action as well, and as values are uh, revealed in actions. And we pursue different kind of purposes or aims. We want to achieve or promote something good. We want uh, the systems to smooth, smoothly and efficiently uh, bring goods, humans and goods from point A to point B. Or we want to evade different kind of uh, accidents. We want to protect or preserve the state of affairs. Uh, balance in different kind of situations or we want to prevent some risks or harms to happen and with different kind of functions uh there are this this might 
these questions or at least these different kind of actions may uh, show us to value conflicts. But the problem is that when values collide, who decides uh, the system or people or uh, who is responsible of deciding which value uh, overruns the other or who is responsible to oversee this value detection. So thank you. This was my short presentation. Thank you, Taina. And then we have Valtteri next. Yes, just a second. So can you see my presentation now? No, not yet. Not Second. yet. Okay. Now we can see your screen. Now it's okay. on. Now it's running. Okay, good. So, hello everybody. My name is Walter Laine. And the topic of this brief presentation is ethics in the context of autonomous ships uh, administrative perspective. So, this is about myself, but as you already know me, so we can skip this one and go straight to the point. So, maritime administration is pretty much regulated through the IMO and the European Commission. And from the ethical point of view, uh, these rules and regulations are pretty much based on our shared values. And the key points here are normally focused on safety on life at sea, protection of the environment, and shipping as an industry, as it offers jobs to millions of millions of people. And it's also a bloodline to global, global economy and industry. And further, there's also a need to protect these values which equals pretty, pretty much to maritime risk management. So this uh, risk management framework is a very, very complex topic. There are a lot of organizations focused on accident prevention, like our agency. So we make port state control and flag state control in order to check that uh, ships uh, meet uh, regulatory requirements. And then we offer piloted services, PPS services, and so on for the government side which is also focused on accident prevention. But if, you know, but if something bad happens, and then there's also uh, organizations focused on pollution preparedness and response. So their main job is to minimize the consequences of the accident. And uh, of course, the shipping companies are key players in this uh, risk management framework. So people who are working on the ship, captains, officers, tech officers, engineers and so on they are they are the so-called sharpened people on this uh, framework and then you have also the people who are working on the office like designated persons of show and uh, general managers and so on they also they have also very important role in this risk management on top there are also uh, registered organizations uh, focused on both accident prevention and minimizing the consequences like Lloyd's resistor PNVGL, and we have PFI clubs who are mainly addressed to me, minimize the consequences of the accident in terms of uh, financial basis and so on. So it's a complex puzzle already nowadays. And uh, then the question is, of course, what will happen through the changes caused by autonomous ships? And in order to explore this topic, the IMO has developed this uh, four, four, four level uh, definition of autonomous ships and here the ships range from uh, conventional ships uh, that are the ships that we have nowadays uh, to all uh, fully automated ships uh, that can be uh, navigated uh, through algorithms and artificial intelligence and so on but regardless of the level of autonomy these mass ships uh, should be equally safe as conventional ships according to IMO, IMO principles and in order to um, ensure this, 
there's a need to make changes on several international conventions like SDCVW, which regulates the quality, uh, the training and, uh, and uh, education requirements for the seafarers. Then we have COLREC rules, which, which are focused on avoidance of collisions at sea. So where we need to think uh, how, to, how to manage the mixture of uh, autonomous ships and conventional, conventional ships, for example. Then we have source regulations that, that uh, regulates the technical requirements uh, for ships. So we need to think uh, what kind of equipment uh, should be uh, should be uh, should meet the, the the requirements of redundancy. Do we need some kind of uh, totally independent systems from each other for certain critical equipments? Out of open questions related to liabilities, for example, so what is the role of captain in the future and what is the role of the people who develop these uh, algorithms if something bad happens and so on. Cyber threats were already mentioned in the in the presentation of uh, Osiris. Other, other issues also related to terrorism and so on. And last but not least, it's a big challenge for the administration how to control all this. Uh, autonomous uh, uh, new things. So, uh, for the time being, uh, our people are not uh, capable to to uh, to evaluate if certain algorithm does the job that it should be doing. And uh, from that point of view, uh, we also need to train our own people to meet the future. And last, uh, little, some things to think about for the discussions. So uh, when we start to develop these algorithms, we also had to think uh, cases where you have only the bad, only bad choices to be made. So this is just an example that is quite often used. So uh, what should the algorithm do in case you have two options, either run over sailing yacht and uh, probably kill the people on board, or in order to avoid these collisions, to run a ground ship and uh, and. Uh, possibly cause uh, environmental damages. So at some point we have to discuss about the priorities of these values also. And uh, last but not least, it's also an ethical question. Uh, if autonomous ships uh, will become ever more popular, many people might also lose their jobs. So seafaring is a very important uh, uh, industry to offer jobs for the people in Asia, for example. So these are also concerns that come out quite often, quite often on the on the scene. So that's pretty much what I was supposed to say at this stage. So thank you. Thank you, Valtteri. And then next we have um, Sauli, and I will uh, show. Can you, Valt? Um, stop sharing. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Nina. Sorry. So, hello, everybody. I'm Sally Loranta, and um, I have a maritime background. I have been very happy to listen to many of the uh, maritime related uh, presentations earlier on this uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, I change over to VTT at the beginning of this year, so I'm now starting to get my feet dry on the dry ground. Um, what I uh, think now, uh, after being in a single industry for pretty much all of my life, is that uh, it's um, very important to look at other industries when you when you start this journey towards autonomizing your own industry. And my first question, ethical question, is that whether you should autonomize or, or not. And uh, actually, I uh, did find already a couple of years back uh, a German federal ministries uh, of, of transport and digital that the uh, German automotive industry had been uh, developing guidelines, um, ethical guidelines uh, uh, related to higher levels of aut uh, automation and autonomy. And I think it's a good example. So I did uh, put here also the uh, website address here so that you can take a look at it at your own leisure once you get these uh, presentations. So one of these interesting questions there is that um, 
should it be an ethical imperative to implement new technology when new technology has been proven to be increasing safety levels? And I think this needs to be taken taken uh, seriously. So, uh, for example, what I did learn during my many years in Rolls Royce and and uh, dealing with this autonomous shipping. Uh, aspect is that it's not only the autonomy that is important, but one important um, step towards autonomy was the enhanced situational awareness that an autonomous vessel needs to have. And same thing is applied to cars or, or autonomous uh, mining machines or, or what have you. So typically my claim is that there, there are lots of uh, technologies today that already enhance uh, human-based situational awareness vastly but we are not mandating the use of those. Rather than contrary, you know, we are finding, I think, uh, sometimes many reasons why not to take them into use. And uh, as we have learned from automotive industry, you know, these, um, these um, autonomous braking systems and, um, and uh, uh, lane guards and, and uh, uh, dynamic cruise controls and all, they are all uh, technologies uh, that are on the way towards autonomy, but they have been taken into use uh, and they will be also uh, compulsory uh, equipment going forward, uh, I think, uh, once they have been proven to enhance the level of safety in driving. So autonomize or not, I think that autonomy, uh, autonomy is not the, uh, the uh, main uh, issue here, but the way towards autonomy is providing a lot of uh, technical solutions that are enhancing our safety. My second point was the autonomy as a social contributor, and I think that this has not been discussed too much. Uh, rather, the contrary, typically automation or aut autonomy is uh, perceived to be synonymous to somebody losing jobs, and I think that Valtteri took that uh, aspect as well in the maritime context. Uh, it's kind of a fear towards autonomy stealing uh, human jobs, uh, but I think that um, for example, uh, the introduction of autonomous systems takes such a long time that, for example, in, in uh, maritime systems, uh, it will take such a long time that even current seafarers would be retiring before this autonomy journey is, is fulfilled. Uh, so I don't think that that can be held against, uh, let's say, a higher aut automation levels. Also, we did uh, do surveys with uh, seafarers and the word autonomy was perceived negatively, but uh, the term increased uh, automation level was perceived positively and not, not really been objected by people. It's not such a kind of a scary term as autonomy. Then I think that automated solutions, once they bring down system costs, they can provide improved services. Again, one example from maritime field could be, for example, these remote islands where you have uh, you know elderly people or, or families with children or what have you uh, if the society is unable to provide uh, scheduled services for such remote locations perhaps the uh, automated solutions can uh, with their lower cost you know enhance their accessibility also during this coronavirus uh, pandemic um, there has been a shortage of, of distributors of goods in some areas, so uh, automated distribution systems might help in, in such areas, but basically maybe taking people out of harm's way or, or providing better social contribution than current system. Then my third one is, uh, is about self-regulation, and I know that this is uh, a bit biased, that we all of us have heard about some recent aviation uh, incidents where uh, which have been connected to a term self-regulation. So in my vocabulary, self-regulation is not the same as you would regulate, uh, let's say, um, everything what you do by yourself. But I think it's more about having a skill and a capability to go beyond the rules. So rules are lagging behind due to the uh, high uh, pace of development in automation. Therefore, uh, if you are uh, introducing automated or autonomous solutions to the market. My view of self-regulation is that you as an industry will pose further requirements for your system performance, safety performance, ethical performance, what have you, which are exceeding the uh, regulatory requirements. So in that sense, um, uh, 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 an accountable industry, just like the German uh, car manufacturing industry in my first case, had published those ethical rules. I think every industry would be 
benefiting uh, on on such an introduction uh, on how how uh, they will manage the introduction of new technology as a whole, not only as a rule fulfilling um, exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Sauli. Can I uh, now ask our panelists uh, to uh, put the video on and uh, we can start the discussion. And in this point, I will hand over to Mika. Thank you, Nina, and, and good afternoon on my behalf as well. Very interesting uh, introductions to the team. I think, and I think, and also the, the previous presentations about the autonomous systems, they already highlighted a number of different uh, uh, safety related and ethics related challenges we might have in, in our autonomous systems. Of course, I mean, our uh, goal over here is to understand how we support the acceptability and desirability as well as. So it is a technical change uh, of, 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 of these technologies which can benefit our society in, in very uh, huge ways. However, at the same time, that was quite interesting. They pointed out, for instance, in, in the presentation about the maritime, maritime uh, autonomous systems, uh, we are creating huge, very complex systems actually at the same time when we are talking about safety, they can be safe, more safe than human systems, but at the same time we might create what we call also systemic risks in the system, uh, uh, in, in the society. So, and actually I would like to open the discussion asking what do you think about these risks that what is kind of, as we, uh, probably don't have any risk-free system. It, 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 is, it, it is not possible. What, what, what would be in your mind in, in this discussion of kind of acceptable risk? Or can I even, is it impossible to pose this kind of question about acceptability of the risk? How, how, would, you, how would you approach this? This is a very difficult question, I know. But in, a, in, the, in the very core of the issue when we are talking about autonomous systems, I think so. Well, at least on this uh, my presentation, there was this IMO principle that autonomous ships should be at least equally safe to convention, conventional ships. So, so that's a kind of uh, yeah, uh, static base, of course. Uh, everybody would like to see uh, that they are even, even safer. But yeah. But I actually get stuck to the concept of safety because mm -hmm. whose safety we are talking about? That's the mm -hmm. question usually that is not defined or uh, said clearly out out loud. Um, for example, for individuals' perspective, you can say that uh, safety is something like sense of being safe without a risk of uh, getting harmed or that. You, or no uh, predicted risks for your neighbors or environment. It's like some some kind of um, experience. But on, on a societal level, you might think that safety is something broader. Um, for example, you, you can define it as the car week has defined it, dynamic non-event that Osiris mentioned before. Um, the situation where there is no nothing uh, untoward happen happening. And and the dynamic part of it means that that's not something that uh, we can persevere without acting. It needs con constant acting and constant constant uh, monitoring and preventing the different kind of risks. So that sorts a uh, few ideas about this concept of safety. Uh -huh. For for me, the issue has been in the pre previous years, the safety level of a human operated system. And uh, what we have found out is that it's very poorly defined. So again, if you want to go to, let's say, maritime environment, you find some legislation from 1960s, you know, how large of an object, a radar or technical 
uh, device needs to detect out in the open sea. But when you go to seafarers, you know, you have to go to their their um, you know um, uh, eye doctor and and see these e letters. How big are they? And then back calculate the number of pixels and what have you. And then if you think of a human operated system, you know. Any time any driver can drive over people, you know, basically uh, it can be uh, intentional or unintentional. You know, people are very prone to fatigue or misjudgment uh, and, and what have you. And I think that it would be a good exercise to, uh, let's say, to exercise the same rigor what you do for automatic systems to a human operated system as well. You know, put them on the same line and check what the outcome would be. I wouldn't know. But I think it would open our eyes that the human operated system does have some quite weak links. Of, of yeah. course they have, yeah. but uh, humans can accept the errors or uh, risks that are caused by humans. It's yes. because we have this moral sense that we can uh, accuse someone. But when this is some kind of robotic or automated system that's, that is causing uh, injuries or harms to humans or environment, there is no one to take responsibility that we we actually need. So there is um, so, some kind of uh, moral thing there that differs who causes the risks or um, that that makes something or some system unsafe. Do you, do yeah, you think Sorry, please go ahead if you want to. Yeah, I was just thinking in maritime sector, the safety is normally understood as a, as a lack of accidents, which is a little bit, uh, it's something like absence of something instead of the presence of something. And I, I kind of like the, uh, that uh, that uh, one slide of, uh, of Mr. Valdez, where, where he showed the, the system and you kindly implement safety to the system. It's, uh, which, is, which seems to be like a very interesting idea. So uh, whenever planning systems, you always need to ask, uh, is this safe? And uh, yeah, I think uh, it could be one one way to approach uh, this uh, this uh, topic. And also, I know that in the shipping industry, there are some, some worries related, related to autonomous ships. So, but, so when a human causes an accident, it's somehow more acceptable than if it's a, if it's a robot that uh, causes this accident. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't know why, why it's like that, but uh, that's how it seems to be, at least uh, what they have been discussed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is, is there, uh, this is a question apparently, I think so, that which has something to do with the uh, acceptability of the risk level as well. I think so. Oh, now also, it relates to also to the multidimensionality of, of, of safety uh, and, and risk as well. So, uh, I mean, um, for instance, in, in these discussions, as is, it was defined, usually as a kind of uh, human safety, that you are safe as, as, a, as a human and there are no, you know, accidents, for instance, or it's environmental safety or something like that. But uh, it, it can be also, for instance, which was already referred data safety as well. It can be also societal safety at the level of the whole society. If we create very complex system, which are, for instance, very apt to cyber attack, for instance, uh, and making our society unfunctional in, in that way as well. And uh, can we ensure actually, or should we, is it impossible? I think it is in, impossible that, that we are not creating such systems which kind of make us more vulner vulnerable as well. Sorry, I'm trying to be a provocative over here. <laughs> Well, if I may comment, so uh, when, when this uh, system gets more automated, I think also the management and control of that system needs to be enhanced. So if you think of, let's say, uh, the current systems, they are not really tuned for highly automated uh, transport and mobility. I would not have a solution for that, but I believe that, um, for example, in vessel tra traffic services, now, there has been recent um, news that uh, they have been introducing AI-based uh, monitoring and follow-up of, of those vessels. So uh, when they want to uh, 
monitor how vessels are moving. Earlier on, it has been like a map and some objects on the map, but not really forecasts of where they were going, you know, in all those previous days or previous years and previous journeys. So that would be a minimum thing. So I, I think that this, um, this um, artificial intelligence and human enhancement might put a person or might put the, 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 let's say, party in charge of management and control to a higher level so that the system may support that uh, controller uh, to give more information so that you are not uh, controlling singular, let's say, commands or events, but you have been pre-processed to see uh, like a system view of how that operates. And uh, that is quite important so that the human being's uh, position in that uh, being in control of the system might step one one step higher up and, and not really controlling like like in a locomotive that you would not uh, you know do all the things you know turning the wheel for every command but you would send a mission to the system that you are controlling i think we need to adapt and change as humans also when we we are approaching this new level yes i think that sauli got really interesting points there <laughs> i um uh, mentioned in my first presentation that this human system interaction, because that is a really uh, big question, for example, in aviation and the commercial airplanes, and how and how to optimize the level of automation and the uh, and the right amount of actions that is uh, left to the human act agents or to pilots because if they don't have enough to do mm. they get too comf comfortable and they cannot uh, react when they are needed and the same situations in is is in um, automated cars and i think that it's over uh, it's all, all over to autonomous transportation systems the same problem and and that i i would really like to know where is the, or how how to make it right level that that they can uh, human can uh, take over and control the system, but uh, at the same time, the automated system may enhance the human capabilities that are really, really limited, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's the, actually the question about the enhancement of human capability, but uh, at the same time, if we enhance the human capability, uh, are we creating something that, that uh, that is uh, out of our reach after all, as a whole system. I'm still coming back to this system kind of point of view, which is very kind of tempting to me to think about it. That, that okay, we can create very single action, single technologies, which as such are very, very, very safe and very useful and, uh, and fine, but they create a huge technological system, which is not anymore that safe, for instance. So, so I, I think that there are some kind of that we need to develop also our thinking in, in this kind of more to the system view of this or what do you think? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, for example, if you take transport system and you have an accident somewhere on a highway, mm -hmm. you might w wait for a call from a police that there is a, you know, an accident and then you call other police with, with your walkie talkie and they are closing roads and doing what have you. The other thing is that, you know, it would trigger through AI an automated sequence of actions, you know, automated calls to emergencies and, and then reducing speed limits and, and uh, rerouting the traffic around this uh, accident scene and all of that. But that means that you would have to pre-program a certain capability to the system, but it would be humans that would be pre-programming those and it would be humans that would be having oversight on those automated systems but my claim would be that it would be uh, more effective than uh, uh, let's say a directly human operated like a singular uh, um, uh, approach where you would need to take action for each one of those things separately so i think that you can in a human can enhance system and, and vice versa and uh, the combination would be better than the current system so yeah. may I still ask that is very good and very very interesting point but if there is an error in the system, and as you said, that, that the system has been developed so efficient that most likely there are less people to taking care of the system. But in the case of error, the humans should take over. And actually, the, I'm, I'm talking about the resilience of the system. So that 
that that it is built so that we trust too much on the technology. Might it be possible in this kind of cases as well? Sorry, I uh, interrupted actually you, you Taina. So please go ahead. Yes, I, I was just saying that I don't have an answer to your questions, this systemic mm -hmm. error question. I think that it's a real question in, in such a way that we need to research and trying to find some kind of solution about these possibilities about this systemic error and how to how to make them work smoothly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we are at five o'clock already. <laughs> sorry that uh, we had to cut it very, quite quite short at this time, but I would like to, uh, there are a few questions or comments um, in the chat, and uh, there was a person <laughs> saying that uh, we tend to talk a lot about physical safety, but what about mental safety? Also, for example, uh, people working with these uh, autonomous vehicles. This was one of the um, uh, comments. Um, and then there was an a, a, a earlier a question. I think this was um, mainly mainly for Valtteri, and it seems that Valtteri has dropped out at, at least from the uh, video. Uh, that it says that would you expect that the public would receive in the same way an accident and incident caused by autonomous unmanned ship as with the equal incident and accident caused by conventional ship? Or this was actually for earlier already. If, if I may comment on this uh, me me mental side, so I think it is. Um, important to to have a very open dialogue uh, you know in the society about these uh, risks and and uh, ethical aspects of automation and autonomy so the worst mistake is that you know you have uh, one party uh, how would i say ruling over the the public debate of these issues so i think that we made a mistake you know with the seafarers when we we're uh, nearly force feeding this uh, joyful story of autonomous shipping and we we use the same uh, message to seafarers whereas we should have been comforting down and having a very let's say a uh, dialogue type of, of discussion about those related incidents with them not not just a marketing pitch and i think this is in the society uh, we need to go through that uh, let's say time consuming thing of, of uh, getting through i mean electrical cars have been left after you know they are now a reality and and uh, all those it takes some time but you would have to face and and answer with facts i think it, it's like facts and emotions that are uh, fighting with each other, you know, in this discussion, but the uh, one cannot suppress the other. They have to, they do coexist. Yes, uh, I would like to comment on the mental safety issue as well. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what is meant as uh, mental safety. Uh, is it uh, the situation where no one needs to fear anything? I think that that's not possible in real world. And I actually think that uh, one of the strengths of the human beings is that we can understand that we are destructible, that we are going to dead in some some situations that we can fear. So that gives us the possibility to react in uh, dangers and risks. And I think that uh, that's uh, one of the strengths of human beings in in um, collaboration situations with, with automated automated systems as well because they don't have the sense of destruction, but we human have, and that may be an advantage. So perhaps the medieval saying, memento mori, remember death is something that we need to uh, keep in our minds. I'm not sure if this is uh, an idea about the mental safety, but <laughs> somehow related. Yes. Thank you. Um, it, there seems not to be any more questions in the chat, but if, if you wish to post some um, or address some uh, some of our panelists, please do so in, in the chat. But uh, since we are now four minutes over time, I think we need to start uh, closing this session and uh, we will make a summary of, of this uh, discussion and that will be uh, delivered to you by some means, probably by email by Hannu. But at this point, I want to thank all of our panelists 
for for your contributions to this afternoon and it, it would have been nice to continue with this discussion but uh, i hope that we will get another chance in another event but now i give a floor to hannu for closing words thank you for my behalf as well yes thank you and uh we have had a lot of interesting stuff in this quite a long session. Uh, thank you for bearing with us. So just to wrap up shortly, first of all, thank you so much for everyone joining this event and staying here until the very end. And as I mentioned, we will send this material to you uh, to recap what has gone, been gone through here in this event. And you are also welcome to contact uh, us about further details regarding RAS and what kind of collaboration we could have with your organization. So just thank you everyone, stay safe and let's be in touch. Thanks. Thank you very much, bye.